Patient all knowing he counts not their sum thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. I sins they are many. of kindness he lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cost we stood neath the debt we could never afford
Good morning, everybody, and welcome to First Baptist Church of Clovis. We are so glad that you're here. And if you're joining us live, please feel free to head over to the chat and say hello. And if you have any prayer requests, let us know. But if you're not joining us live, please don't let that stop you from saying hi. Just drop it down in the comment section and we'd love to hear from you. Now, before we get started with our service, I just want to let you know what's going on with the youth. Every Wednesday, Thursday, and Sunday, we're doing something. And if you want more information, head to fbccyouth.com. Okay, now this is the part where I'm going to hand it over and you guys are going to enjoy your service. And I hope you do. Have a blessed day. Hey everyone, I just want to give you a quick update about plans to potentially return to church. Uh, here's what I'm kind of trying to balance is there's kind of two types of people. Uh, which one are you? Come on, Owen. Let's do better than this. You know I can be found living on love. So this is a little bit like what returning back to normal life might look like, uh, even in the church. You're going to have some people that want to have healthy distance uh, for any number of reasons. And you're going to have people who want to, you know, hug and roll down the, the aisle of the church and, and just give everybody handshakes, high fives and, and whatnot. And I want to balance the needs of both groups, if you will, and honor people who uh, might still be immunocompromised or might still have fears or anxieties about returning, but also honor the people that need healthy community because it's important and it is what God desires for us. I, uh, just full disclosure, I find myself on a bit more of the cautious side just because uh, I care about the health and well-being and, uh, of our people. And even literally as I shoot this video, my wife is working with a, a COVID-19 patient as a physical therapist over at Fresno Community Hospital. And so it's actually me that is a potential uh, threat or risk to our elderly population or other people who are um, at risk uh, when they become exposed. And so Again, I just ask for patience. Uh, this Monday, I'll be getting together with a team of people from our church to look at what resuming, uh, when legally able to do so, might look like for our church. And we plan on rolling out everything, uh, all the plans for you to, to look down, the safety precautions, what service might be best for you with different tolerance levels. Uh, to be clear, I don't, again, like I said last week, I don't want to live in a spirit of fear and timidity, um, but I also don't want to jump foolishly into anything. I want it to be well thought out and suited for our church. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. But to balance that out, Proverbs 21.5 says, The plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. And so I want to toe that line well as we enter um, the new normal that is upon all of us. Uh, so if you have any questions, concerns, ideas, please feel free to reach out and contact me personally uh, or anyone on staff that you feel comfortable with. Uh, or if you just have a funny joke that you want to share with me or anyone else, uh, I think we could all use a good laugh these days. So uh, I hope you're doing well. Reach out. Let me know how you're doing. And I look forward to seeing you again. Our brotherhood is etched in stone. This unbeaten path we walk is never alone. And through the trails of terror, there is no obstacle we won't fear. Because we are unbroken. Unbroken. I would die for you. And you would give your life for me. The very sense of being free. Can we revisit the times of past as if I wish they would never fade and always last? For no demon real or in mind could ever challenge the courage of brotherhood tested in time. So may we walk 
in the memory of those who forever hold the burden of our freedoms. And I promise to never let your memory die because I'm free in it. And you are always with me and never forgotten. There's a story of a American missionary who was working in a small town in Africa and he was with the Christian community there. And he heard at one point the women of the village while washing their clothes singing this absolutely beautiful song. Their harmonies were almost haunting. They spoke so deeply to his soul. And he eventually asked, the pastor who could also speak English, what the ladies were singing about, assuming it was some absolutely deep moving song. And he said, oh, the ladies are simply singing songs a, a missionary doctor taught us. And the lyrics basically meant, if you don't wash your hands, you will get dysentery. And that is a great illustration of how just the sound of music can move us. The sounds we hear when melodies and harmonies, when different frequencies of sounds interact, they can move us deep in our souls. Just the music itself, even without meaning. I've been at plenty of uh, concerts of non-Christian bands where I've been filled with different emotions from excitement to joy to sadness, depending on the tones in the music. But when it comes to our worship music, our primary goal is not to be moved by those musical tones. They're important, that's why God gave us music. But we don't simply want to be moved by the music. That's not worship. Just because we get those warm fuzzes inside, that's not worship. Christ isn't simply adored and, and, and praised when we stand there singing with our lips moving and our hearts engaged in just that feeling or no feeling at all. Christ is worshiped when the words that we sing move our minds and our hearts to adore him more, to delight in him more. That's why the words of the songs that we sing are so crucial. But I don't know about you, sometimes the words can just pass me by. If it's a new song that we're singing, I can be so focused on singing the right notes, the right length of time, that I'm not particularly focused on the words, the lyrics. Or if it's a really familiar song, I can be so used to singing it without having to think about it that I can be thinking about something else completely differently. But when we sing these praises to Christ, we want our hearts and our minds to adore him more because of it. One exercise I found that can be really helpful for that is simply by reading the lyrics of a song as poetry. And so you can do that with any worship song. For example, the first song that we're going to sing this morning is called Jesus is Better. And let me just read to you the verse and the chorus so that you can hear the words before you sing them. It starts off, there is no other so sure and steady, my hope is held in your hands. When castles crumble and breath is fleeting, upon this rock I will stand. Upon this rock I will stand. And when we sing those words, our hearts should be filled with comfort and encouragement because of the surety of Christ, because of how firm a foundation he is. And then the chorus says, glory, glory, we have no other king but Jesus, Lord of all. We raise the anthem, our loudest praises ring, we crown him Lord of all. And this is just a declaration of our hearts because, of so, because Christ is so worthy. We want to celebrate him and crown him as the Lord of lords and the King of kings and the God of all gods. And so as we sing these songs this morning, 
I encourage you to read these lyrics and let the truth of the words sink deep into your mind and deep into your heart that you may adore Christ more and give him all the worship that he deserves.
the cross I cannot comprehend the agonies of Calvary you the perfect holy one crush your son you drank the bitter cup reserved for me your blood Washed away my sin, Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied, Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table, Jesus, thank you. So Andy and I were reflecting a few weeks back as we were talking about what sermon series we want to do in the future, what we could talk about, teach on, especially under the circumstances with everything going on. And then we sort of stumbled across a truth that we think is true for us as individuals, as um, a Western society, uh, and even Christians, is sometimes we don't suffer real well. Uh, We can complain, we can argue, we can become contentious. Uh, And I confess that at first, as I I started thinking about it, I thought, well, you know, it's because we're noble. We don't want other people to suffer, so we carry their burdens and we help them out. And that's fairly true of Western society. But then when push comes to shove, when it comes to the individual being forced to suffer, here was the realization. We don't suffer that well. We can very quickly give in to alleviating that pressure of suffering, that trial, with self-medication or alleviation with uh, something that is sinful or not designed for us, when in reality, God just might want us to suffer a little bit uh, and use that to help us grow. 
And with everything going on, we just thought, man, let's do a sermon series on suffering well. I, I admit some of the desire to do this series came a little bit because of everything going on. Uh, and it culminated with honestly a lot of comments that I would see online and from people. Um, you know, the one that I kind of heard a lot and, and don't, don't feel attacked if you've used this. Okay. Uh, my laundry list of, you know, putting my foot in my mouth is probably much longer than yours, but I kept seeing the phrase, uh, follow the constitution, unless there's a pandemic, then it's all out the window. And it was being used sarcastically to say, listen, we should still follow the constitution even when there's a pandemic. But, but what started bothering me, especially with my brothers and sisters in Christ, is I want you to follow that logic, is what about our call to love others, serve others, be good to others, be humble towards others, pray for others, bless those that persecute you, pray for your enemies, do all those things, unless there's a pandemic, then just stop and be contentious and argumentative and complaining and not humble. We as Christians are called to a higher standard than the Constitution. And so I thought, man, even when this is all over, or <laughs> this version of it is all over, and we enter the next era of what's going on with COVID-19, Christians will still suffer. There will be something individually, maybe as a church, corporately, the church around the world, Christians will still be called to suffer, and not just suffer, but to suffer well for God's glory. And again, I want to be clear that while I personally can get annoyed with things that I hear, comments that I read, attitudes that are expressed, and while I was sitting on maybe my self-righteous horse, you know, from time to time, it hit me that just because I do suffer well in those ways, maybe in the public forum when I'm in front of people, the truth is I don't always suffer well. We each have our different areas of strength and weakness. And I know that I don't suffer well. I mean, in certain situations, you get me in front of a situation with bad customer service. Oh man, some of you probably have stories of Nick on the phone with someone uh, that had gave him bad customer service or wasn't able to do what they were supposed to do. I mean, I don't suffer well when there's injustice. Uh, social injustice. And I'm not even talking about like real social injustice, like human trafficking or something. I mean, I'm talking about, you know, someone cuts in front of you in the line at Jamba Juice when you're with your youngest daughter waiting for 10 minutes. They don't even look at you, say hi or say sorry, hypothetically speaking. I don't suffer well when uh, the needs uh, for affection that I have from, that I want from my wife, when those aren't met, man, I can become a, a whiny baby. Or when someone presumes upon my free time, man, they might not hear it, but that grumbling spirit inside of me, um, the complaining internally, I'm not suffering well. I'm just suffering and feeling bad for myself. I might externally look patient. I might look long-suffering, but internally and sometimes externally, I'm not great at suffering. So we're going to do a series called Suffering Well. And not because we desire it, like we want suffering for everybody, or that we should bring it upon ourselves or be gluttons for punishment. That would be silly and uncalled for and be weird. But we should be ready for it when it's called upon us. When the Lord asks us to suffer well for him, we should be ready. So first, we have to acknowledge that not everybody listening is like, yeah, I totally remember in the Bible when people suffered or were called to suffer or that they suffered well or that God even wants us to suffer for his glory. Not everyone knows all of those places in the Bible. And so it's going to be good for us to explore this topic, taking a look at people. Now, there's going to be people where this concept of suffering well is new altogether. Like, why would God want me to suffer? How will God use my suffering? And to others, this concept of suffering well might just be a better understanding of what God wants from us. And to some, it might just be an encouragement to keep doing what you're doing and do it well. 
And lastly, for many, it might just be an opportunity to hear in words what it is God wants for you and for other Christians and help you better articulate to others how to suffer well. In the upcoming weeks, instead of just focusing on the theology of suffering, we're going to take a look at people uh, in Scripture, people who lived a life and, and they have a story where you know, for circumstances out of their control, they were called to suffer, how they did it, and how they didn't suffer well at times. We're going to see what God tells them and how he encourages them. We're going to hear their stories from the Old and the New Testament, some familiar stories and some likely lesser known ones, but all of them ran through the filter of suffering well, again, for God's glory. So let's hop in. Does Jesus really want us to suffer well, maybe even give our lives? I think it's important to start with the words of Jesus himself. And to do that, we're going to actually jump to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where we see some of Jesus' last words to his disciples. Acts 1, 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I love this verse because it it shows a picture of like concentric circles, Jerusalem, and then the outlying area of Judea and Samaria. It gets further and further away, and eventually to the ends of the world, there's this picture of it spreading like a virus. Too soon? Uh, And it's done through the Holy Spirit living in them and witnessing, he says. So, for fun, we're going to jump over to blueletterbible.com, where we explored this word, witnesses, and what it means. And you can take a look at what I discovered this week. So we go to the website, and we check out what the Greek word for witness is, and here it is. Does it look familiar? It should. It almost looks like the word martyr. In fact, it has the same root word for martyr, someone who's willing to die for their faith. But at this point, when Jesus says this, no one has died for their faith except Jesus himself, but not his followers. They're about to get filled with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost and start spreading the good news of the gospel, the good news of Jesus around the world, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. But then we get to this fascinating chapter in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 7. In fact, it starts towards the end of chapter 6, where we hear about the life of a man named Stephen. Stephen, uh, likely a deacon, but definitely a leader in the early Christian church. Uh, it, It was said that he was a man full of grace and power, and that he did many wondrous things. It was said of him that the opposition couldn't come against him because of the amount of wisdom that he had because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And so the rulers, the religious leaders of the day were angry with him because people started following him and, and, and believing the story of Jesus and the truth of Jesus coming back from the dead. And they didn't want their power taken. So they made up false lies and they eventually seized him. And they they said that he said blasphemous and untrue things about God. And so they seized him and they pulled him in front of the whole council of the Sanhedrin. And he was put on trial to answer for these false accusations that were brought against him. We see it at the end of uh, chapter 6, verse 15. It says, All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently as Stephen and then Stephen delivers this masterful sermon that is awesome because he's going to draw them in. Right now, he's being accused of not being a good Jewish person. He's not being a good Jewish man. He's telling blasphemous things about God. And if they can find something blasphemous, then then they can find a reason to kill him or stone him. And so what Stephen does next for the next few dozen verses is he starts to tell the story of God's people and how they suffered throughout history in various ways. He goes all the way back to Abraham, and he's like, do you remember? And you got a picture, he's talking to like this crowd, this, um, uh, I don't know, amphitheater style of Sanhedrin, these religious leaders listening to him, and they're probably starting off like, convince me, you know? And, And he just starts beautifully describing, he's like, you remember Abraham? Father Abraham? 
and how he was called out of the land and, and he was brought to the promised land. You remember the promised land? You can almost picture the Sanhedrin like, yes, the promised land, the good old days. I love this story. And then he goes on and he's like, and then fast forward a little bit. You remember how Joseph and his, his brothers, our patriarchs, they sold him into slavery. They were going to kill him and they sold him into slavery. And then he went into the land of Egypt, but then he was elevated. He was elevated and he did what was right. And he's telling the story of Joseph. Like, yeah, Joseph. And then you remember our people were enslaved for 400 years by those same Egyptians. Do you remember that? And you can almost picture the Sanhedrin like, yeah, those scoundrels. Man, they hurt our ancestors, but... I know how this story goes. And you know, like when you know a story and you almost, you love hearing someone else repeat it. And you're like, oh yeah, I remember. That's my story that leads to me. Well, Stephen keeps on telling the story of God's people throughout history. He talks about how uh, Moses would come along and he would he would bring the people out of Egypt. Moses would go and he to the burning bush and he would remove his sandal. He's in the presence of the great I am. And that, that, that voice would tell him, go set my people free. Then Stephen articulately starts to remind them of all the miracles that Moses would have done. The parting of the Red Sea. And he reminded them that the people still grumbled. And they, they wanted to turn back and go back to Egypt after Moses had done this. And you can almost picture like the Sanhedrin going, yeah, man, those guys, Moses, Grandpa Moses. And then he would talk about the tabernacle where God would reside. He would talk about Jacob and he would bring up names like David and how David wanted to build a temple and then how uh, his son Solomon would be the one that would actually build the temple. And at this point, you could just picture him sucking them in and they're like, yes, David, Solomon, Jacob, Abraham, Moses. Oh, they love these names. And remember, he's on trial for saying blasphemous things. And at this point, he's only spoken the truth. And that whole Sanhedrin is like, oh man, I love this story. Wait, why is this guy on trial? He could likely stop right now and end with everyone going, those were the good old days. I know my Torah. I know my Bible. And you could almost picture Stephen going, have I said anything blasphemous? And they would have to say no. And he could be, he could just walk away. He could say, cool, I'm out then. See you later. But that's not how it finished and that's not what he said verse 51 he turns it around on them you stiff-necked people your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised you are just like your ancestors you always resist the holy spirit was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute they even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one and now you have betrayed and murdered him you who have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. Man, have you ever had an argument won? And if you would have just stopped talking, it would have been fine, but you just felt good. So you just kept going. You're like, yeah, yeah. And get back in the kitchen and make me a sandwich. Ooh, yeah, you just lost. You can't help but feel like that for Steven just a little bit. But you see, he didn't lose. He was proving a point that God wanted him to prove. Because in the story of God's people, these religious leaders, those in power, they thought they were the good guys. And Stephen sets the record straight and says, no, listen, you're wrong. You see, in this story, Jesus is the good guy. You're the bad guys that killed all those good guys before. And you killed Jesus, our Savior, but he came back three days later. That's the good news. And Stephen was coming to set the record straight. So why did he do this? Was it an accident? No. Stephen's goal was not to find comfort or draw a get out of jail free card. It was to use this opportunity to tell the truth. He was a first generation leader in the church and his goal was to spread the truth. And it's important to note that while he was direct in calling out sin and rebuking the Sanhedrin, he was stating what they did to Jesus, not to him. He wasn't fighting for his rights, his comfort. He wasn't trying to argue for himself. He was trying to set the record straight on Jesus and theology and God's story of God's people and how they were messing 
it up, but he wasn't arguing for his rights. He was arguing for God's kingdom, for God's truth in the midst of all these religious people who were supposed to already be doing that. He was lied about. He was illegally seized. He was forced to endure illegitimate trial. But he cared more about the cause of Christ than he did his own cause. And that's what's important to see here. And in this time, showing the people their hypocrisy for how they treated Jesus was what was asked of Stephen. Sometimes this process in our time is loud and sometimes it's quiet. Sometimes it's quick and sometimes it takes a long time. But let's make a distinction here with grace. Stephen is not talking about coffee cups at Starbucks. He's not talking about whether or not people say Merry Christmas or Happy Holidays or how a secular government treats religious people. He was telling those in religious power that they no longer stood with God. They, in fact, stood against God. It's important to remember that anything we say or do and how we say and do it should be ran through the filter of Jesus. Jesus, the only time we see him really get all up in arms is against those in religious power who are perverting their power and using it for own personal gain. But for those that were broken or were far from God, even those in power like Caesar or Pilate or all of them, he didn't have harsh words. In fact, he told his, uh, he told his followers to still respect authority and, and Paul would write later about honoring authorities. He was coming after the religious power to make sure they didn't inf- interfere anymore with what his disciples needed to do, which was to go and love a world in a way they had never seen before. And what did Stephen get for his efforts? We pick up in verse 54, Acts chapter 7. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this They covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. So, we see Stephen knowing that the end is here. And all of a sudden, his focus is not on the rabble, is not on the yelling, the screaming, the danger, the scary. His focus all of a sudden is on Jesus. Now, there's a lot of conjecture here, but it is still a beautiful image of Jesus standing. Because Jesus is uh, in heaven, seated on the throne, but here he's standing. This is the first instance of a Christian dying for their faith. In, in scripture, at least, we don't know for certain uh, if it just wasn't recorded before, but it's, it's widely accepted that Stephen was the first martyr. He died for his faith. And for that first martyr, you see Jesus standing almost as if to give an ovation to say, well done, good and faithful servant. And who do we have at his feet? Saul, also named Paul, who would become the writer of roughly two thirds of our New Testament And this verse, interestingly, directs us forward to Acts chapter 22, where Paul is talking about this very incident. And you can almost imagine the sense of pain Paul would have in recalling this. He's like, man, my old self. Do you remember a time where you just loathed the way that you acted? You can't believe you said those things or thought those things? I can only imagine Paul feeling that way now as he says this, Acts 22, 19. Lord, I replied, these people know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr, Stephen, was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Jesus says to go and be a witness, to be a martyr. That very word martyr used in this verse is the exact same word as the word witness before. Literally the same exact Greek word. 
But since, of a, since most of us don't live in a world where our life is actually asked of us, thankfully, but in parts of the world that is asked of them. But since most of us don't live in that world where we're being asked to die for our faith, we're called to be what the Bible says, living sacrifices. Romans 12 talks about this. To live a life sacrificing for the Lord, sacrificing your desires, your agenda, your power, your will, and nailing them to the cross because you want God's will, God's desire, God's eyes, God's heart, and God's mind to be in you. But to do that, you have to sacrifice yourself. But the problem with living sacrifices is they want to crawl off the cross. They want to crawl off the, crawl off the altar. And so it takes daily checking ourselves, testing ourselves, begging the Holy Spirit, please continue to live in me. And let me sacrifice myself so that only you remain. And not only be a living sacrifice, but to do it in such a way that leaves people asking, how do they do that with, with such joy, humility, and without complaining? The scripture is pretty clear that we're called to suffer well. 2 Timothy 3, 12 through 15 reads, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus." Paul knows that we can't always change others. We can't always change them, but we can choose to obey God and be who he's called us to be. That, in fact, has the best chance of changing anyone or this world. It's important to remember that just like anything else, you don't just decide one day to suffer well, like, oh, that was really inspiring. I'm gonna suffer well. If you agree that you need to suffer well, then you need to remember that it's not just as easy as saying, that's it, from this day forward, I will suffer, suffer well. It takes mental and spiritual, maybe even physical prep, but most importantly, it takes abiding in Jesus, staying connected to Jesus, because it's Him doing it in you. I, I picture I just recently did a CPR class through uh, someone from our church who put on a class, and I have to say, hands down, this was the best experience with learning CPR, but... As I sat there thinking, I will never forget this. This was so clear, so concise. I sit here today, not more than two months later, I think. Uh, I was sitting by the pool actually at a birthday party just yesterday, and I saw a little kid running by, and I thought, what would happen if he fell in the pool? You know, you just sit there and think random things. Would I be ready to go save him? And then I thought, yeah, I have CPR class. And then I went, how many compressions? How many rescue breaths? What song do I do it to? Staying alive, staying alive. No, wait. Yeah, no, yeah, how many beats per minute? I remember just thinking and, and, and wondering, man, how in two months did I forget? So if I want to remember even CPR, which they've made as simple as you can, they give you those AED machines and with the electric paddle thing, and, he's, and I'm like, do I test them on my tongue first to make sure they work? I need to remember to go brush up, go online. So yesterday I went in online and looked, okay, how many breaths? How many compressions? For how long? What steps do I do? And it's like that for suffering well. We have to set our mind to it, and then we have to prepare for it and be ready for it always. A person doesn't accidentally do CPR right when trying to help somebody. And the same is true about suffering well. You won't accidentally suffer well, not without spiritual and mental, maybe even physical preparation and abiding in Christ through it all, inviting the Holy Spirit to do it through you because it's not you doing it, it's Him. And so we're going to take a look at a few tangible steps that we want to invite the Holy Spirit to come do through us. We don't need to have all of the answers for when suffering strikes, but we can have a few great promises because we won't have all of the answers, and we need to be honest with that. But when we cling to the promises of God through this, and when we take a look at how other sufferers, faithful sufferers uh, for Christ, have walked and crawled before and beside us, we can learn some really valuable things. Number one, 
Remember what waits for you. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 4 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. And where is this inheritance? This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. This is coaching 101, a mother giving birth who's in pain and suffering and and a loving, adoring husband who says, listen, just remember, you're going to be holding that baby. Keep fighting the good fight. It's worth it. And pointing to holding that baby in your arms or or when you're a a coach of a team and you're saying, man, I know these push-ups are harder. These sit-ups are harder. This training is hard. But just imagine hoisting that trophy. It helps when we point to the vision of why we're doing what we're doing. And so Peter, who, by the way, lived in a time where the emperor began actively blaming and killing Christians, sets his readers up to keep their eye on the good prize before delivering the admittedly hard news in the next verse. 1 Peter 1, 6 continues, And all this you greatly rejoice Though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Peter, Mr. Chop Off the Soldier's Ear First and Ask Questions Later, is encouraging followers of Jesus to suffer well by remembering what waits for them in heaven. He's learned his lesson about looking before you leap. Remember to run his actions through the filter of what Jesus desires for him. No longer wanting his will in this life, but wanting only Jesus's. And one way he stays fueled is to be reminded and encouraged that there's a greater treasure waiting for me in heaven. And anything that I could attain in this world will be nothing compared to the inheritance that I have waiting for me in heaven from God. And number two step that we can take to suffer well is to let suffering refine you, not define you. Let suffering refine you, not define you. 1 Peter 1, 7 now, continuing on. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Peter's using the analogy of heating up metal to refine it, to purify it, to make it more valuable and clean. Our faith in action, if we bother to use our faith in such a way, is refined and proven to others and sometimes even ourselves. Suffering, suffering well especially, is like a fire, a refiner's fire. I used to wonder about swords and, and sword makers. And when you watch those old videos of them, I was just always enamored. You take a piece of metal and you'd, you'd melt it. You'd, you'd uh, make the form of a sword and then you'd reheat it up in the fire and then you bang it and then you put it in the cold freezing water and then they heat it up again and they bang and they put it in the cold water and then they take a sharp object and they grind it away to sharpen it and polish it. And I, I remember just thinking to myself, like, if I was that sword, that would hurt. That's a lot of banging and heating up and cooling off. It sounds like torture. But when we choose to let suffering refine us, the end product is better than just a lump of metal that just sits there. It is a a sharp and, and shiny and beautiful instrument that can be used to protect and save others when wielded in the proper hands. But we need to allow ourselves to be refined. But the truth is sometimes we can let Suffering define us, and we can use suffering as an excuse not to serve God, an excuse not to obey Him, not to love and forgive others and do all the other things that Jesus wants for us. We throw up our hands and we say, this world is just a mean place and I want no part of it. But we're not defined by the world and we shouldn't be influenced and, and act and live according to what the world wants. We find our identity in Christ. We are who he says we are. And we do better when we remember, I am bought, I am chosen, I am loved, I am made new, I am forgiven. 
And now I get to be the hands and feet of Jesus because I have let him refine me and now use me for his purposes. And the third piece of advice or step for us to prepare to suffer well is to not suffer alone. And this might be the hardest one right now, given the state of everything that's going on. And likely Satan's greatest tactic right now is keeping us isolated. And we need to realize it and overcome it by the grace of God. But Peter, yet again, tells us multiple times not to suffer alone. 1 Peter 4, 8. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly. And in 1 Peter 1, 22, he says, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. And again, good old Pete, 1 Peter 3, 8, he says, finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. If we're going to be honest, when suffering comes, we usually have less energy and strength to love others. But we're reminded that our love for one another shouldn't rest on our our ability or our strength. If it does, it's not real love because real love only comes from God loving through us. And it won't glorify the God who wants to use us when we're weak. When we're weak, He is strong. When suffering comes, leaving you weak and worn out, expect God to use you to care for someone else in some new and more meaningful way. 1 Peter 2, 21 and 24, Peter writes, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. There's a world out there that is waiting and wanting for us, needing for us to take our man-made crosses, our excuses, our desires, and nail them to the cross, following in the footsteps of Jesus, who took our sins and nailed them to the cross so that we could be this new thing, not this new thing that creates this fake cross to carry, There's a world needing to see a body of believers live this out, to live for righteousness, to seek justice, show mercy, but also walk humbly with our God, defending truth, but not demanding it on others, but living it out so that they have a desire to know truth, that we produce a fruit for others to taste and see that the Lord is good. I pray that we all go to the Lord this week and and really ask Him, how we're doing in this area. Maybe even ask a friend or someone you trust, do I suffer well for God's glory? If not, what is hindering me? And I I ask everyone to ask that, not because I have this perfected or that anybody does, but if we're going to be followers of Christ that are actually attractive to a world that even though it might despise us, it still respects us, then we need to be asking this question of ourselves. If we're going to look at a world and say, you need Jesus, we need to remind ourselves daily, I need Jesus, before I go telling others that they need Jesus. And it should produce good fruit, a humble spirit that does speak boldly, but with gentleness and kindness and producing good works. And when we do this, People can't help but see the change in us and feel the blessings from God through us and into their lives. May these things be said of us during this time and beyond for God's glory. I'll pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you that um, there's healing happening in the world. I thank you that you are still good. I thank you that you've given us Um, people in the Bible that we can go to, heroes of the faith that have lived it well, and you've even recorded those that did not for us to study. And in the upcoming weeks, as we take a look at um, other apostles in the New Testament and, and prophets in the Old Testament and heroes of the faith listed, that we can learn from them. We thank you that some people have led the way well and some have paid the dumb tax for us. But we thank you that no matter what, Even if we don't live perfectly, you forgive us. And all it takes is us repenting and accepting your forgiveness. 
but may we move forward in loving well, living for you, being living sacrifices, and that we shine for you in everything that we do in this world. Even when we're suffering, you get the glory. Lord, help us suffer well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, and let's continue in worship together.
trust in